Hello, we will be talking about backing up Postgres today. I will start it out by talking about some of the benefits of doing continuous backups of Postgres. After that, we are going to take a new server and we're going to set it up all from scratch. It will be quite fast, but don't worry about that because I will link all the commands from the description of this video. I'm going to explain the commands as I run them. When we are done with all the servers and we have created the backups and restored the backups and play with that back and forth, we are going to talk a little bit about things things that you have to think about because there are some things that might seem a little bit odd unexpected at least could be the word for that so that is at the end i think it wouldn't be fair to leave you without telling you about it let's go three reasons to do backups like i do the backups number one it's more flexible and safer than your cloud providers snapshot backups it's more flexible since you can go back to any time that you want, not just the time when you took the backup because of the continuous nature of this backup process. It's safer for that same reason because you can go back just before the accident happened and restore to that or fetch some data depending on what you want to do. But when it comes to your snapshot backups, you have just that one to go back to. Number two, it's cheap. It's really cheap because the backup process is backing up to S3. There are lots of providers. The best one I have found is Storadera. They give you 50 gigs for free. Then it's only six euro per terabyte. And of course you just pay for whatever you use. Another thing that is very good with them is that they do not count requests or the transfer because you will be backing up stuff. So you will be sending the wall a lot depending on how much your database is being used. It's good to know what you will actually pay and Storadera, they make this very simple. And you can compare that to your VPS providers, snapshot backups that they have, it's usually 20% of the server costs. If you increase the server because you need more memory, because you have more data, uh, your backup costs also go up. It will go up with the other option too, of course, but it's not even close to how much it costs. And then we have number three, there are no lock-ins. Like if I do a backup into my storage account or my S3 provider, I can then restore this to a different host if I wanted to move my database server. I just create it, let's say it was on DigitalOcean, and now I want to move it to Linode or Scaleway or whatever. I would just start the server over there and I would start it up and it will just fetch the backups for me. I don't know if that's even possible if you want to do that with snapshots. Now that you know that you want to have continuous backups, Let's have a look at the tools that make this whole thing work. Wall G. Wall G is according to their documentation, an archival restoration tool. I don't know what that means, but for me, it takes care of sending the data to S3, encrypting it, of course, for before, fetching it when I need it, deleting the data that I don't need anymore. It's basically taking care of everything. Envdir. Envdir comes from Demon Tools. All it does, or I shouldn't say all it does. I mean, it does a fabulous job. But still, all it does, it's loading the content of a folder into environment variables, which is very helpful when you're working with wall G. Okay, enough talking, let's do this. Let's set up a new machine where we install Postgres and we hook it up with some continuous backups, which is what this video is about. Every command that I do that is related to backups, I'm going to explain it. If you are like me and you don't want to type too much, then you can copy and paste from the link that I will put in the description. Let's jump into Linode and create a server. I'm using Linode because I have credits here. That's why. And um, yeah, I'll just create the cheapest one. This is actually nice. As you can save SSH keys. And we do not want the backups. Let's log in. Sometimes I will have to do this a couple of times. Sometimes a couple of times yeah, because it's not up yet completely, even though the UI says it is. Okay, great. Now we have the server. What I usually do nowadays is to have Notion where I copy and paste my commands into. So I write some helpful text for myself and then I copy them into these code blocks because then I get this copy button here so I can just copy them out. The first thing I'm going to copy in is the 
commands taken directly from the official Postgres website of adding the repository for Ubuntu and updating the packages and also installing Postgres so that we are just going to put that in. So I'm pasting it in here and then we run it. Great, now we have a running Postgres 14 machine. So I'm just going to add this. The next thing we are going to install is the daemon tools where we get the nvd from. After this, it's time to get wallg and we are going to use vget to download it from GitHub. This URL here was something I picked up from their GitHub page where you can see all the binaries for wallg. And then we just un uh, decompress it. And after that, we're going to move it into the position we want to have it in, in our system. So just copy that in. Great, now we have all G. And now we have come to the point where we configure all G. And you can see that I have some sensitive information in here, but I you might be worried about me. But these are not accurate anymore when this video goes live. I assure you of that. So I just put them in here because then it's much easier for me to do the demo. And also if I want to copy this to another machine, maybe Notion isn't the greatest, but your password system could have all of these just like this. And you can just paste them into another machine. Anyway. Let's start from the top. We have umask to set the permissions of the files that we are about to create. And we are going to set them to be read, write and execute for the user. And the group will write and execute, uh, read and or execute. Uh, and the others, they will not be able to do anything. And then we create the folders that we need or the folder with the parent folders. So we are going to use ECC, wallg, env. And the and it's the environment for wallg that we are creating. After that, we are going to configure the PG host that will be used by wallg, and we are going to connect via sockets. So this is the file path for that. And then we have the wallg delta max steps, and that is a setting for how many delta copies you will have between every full backup that you do. And then we put the S3 keys. These are actually stored error keys, but they use the same environment variables as AWS. So we put the access key and we put the secret. This is the secret. And then we have the wallg S3 prefix. And this is the folder that you want to store it inside your S3 provider. And I'm using the bucket called Postgres backups and I'm putting it in a folder called new. I'm going to show you that we don't have that currently. I can show it right now. Uh, I only have these folders in here. So there is no new folder in here. After we are done, there will be. And then we put the endpoint. This is what you will get from your S3 provider, which is stored there. Again, I keep mentioning them, but here they are. You can't uh, not say it when it's in the text. So it's a AWS endpoint. If you use any other storage than S3, you will have to read the documentation for that. But then you replace these with whatever you're selecting. They have a bunch of options for that. But I suggest you go with S3 because it's very good. And after that, we set the configuration for encryption. So you set your key and you set what type of um, format that the key has. And I have selected hex. You can select whatever you want. In the documentation, they say that you should use this to generate the key. So you, I could uncomment this and do this instead. But since I want my documentation to be able to be used again with the same files, I am putting the key in here. That means that if I use this exact Com, uh, configuration, I will be able to decrypt the backups. If I change this or if I lose this key, my backups will not be able to be restored. So remember that, that you have to save the, in, uh, the, the key 
for the encryption because otherwise you will lock yourself out and you won't have a backup. Okay, and hex this is important. So if you have this one and you select to go with a hex here, then you will have to use hex. After that, after we have echoed all of these into these uh, files, all of these values, maybe I should also explain echo. Echo will just print out anything that you type inside of these citation marks. Then we use the angle here to print it into a file. So whatever was in that file will be erased and this will be added instead. If you have two of them, it will be appended, but this one is replaced when it's only one. Okay, so let's do this now. Copy it, paste it in. Great, now we have the wall G configured. Now we need to configure Postgres. And Postgres, we only really need to set three settings. First, we set the archive mode to yes, which means that wall G will get the wall write ahead logs from Postgres. Sorry for interrupting. I just want to say that I was using yes as the value for archive mode. And if we look at the documentation here, we can see that the values should be always on and off. And yes and no and all those other variants are not in here. But if we dig into the source code of Postgres, we can see that all of them are actually supported. So that's why it's working in this tutorial or in this video. I'm not suggesting that you should use these other variants. You should stick to these top three. I didn't. I'm sorry for that. This archive command that we are going to set will be the command that Postgres runs every time there is another wall file to be archived. And in our case, it will call nvdir and it will give it the environment folder, I mean, where we put all the configuration. And then it's going to call wall G with that information loaded into environment variables. And it's going to call the wall push command of wall G with the wall file that is about to be archived. So we put that at the end of the Postgres QL conf file and we put the archive timeout to 60. That means that if nothing happens in 60 seconds, it will write whatever it has, if it has something. As you can see, all of these have double arrows, which means that they will be appended, not replaced, because otherwise this file will be empty and that's not what we want because that's bad. So let's copy it and paste it in. Great, now we need to restart Postgres. If we don't restart Postgres, it will not know that uh, we have changed the configuration. And now it's time for us to do our first base backup. But let's first walk through the command. First, I'm going to make sure this command is ran by Postgres user. And we use the nvdir that we saw before in the archive command with the environment variables and we call wall G. And we do the backup push command with the folder that is the data folder for Postgres. And we are using Postgres 14, as you can see here, because it's in the path. So I don't know, there is nothing else to explain about that, I think. And paste it in here and you will see. I will tell you what happened is that I can't switch to that folder because I was in the root home directory and uh, we can't run Postgres command from within that directory because the Postgres user cannot go into the root folders, uh, root users home directory. Great. But now we have back made a base backup and we have our system backing up. So let's ensure that this is happening. If I reload this, we will see the new folder happening here and we can see the base backup here and we will see the wall in here. That's it. Now our data is being backed up continuously to stored era. But backing up data is not worth very much if you don't know how to restore it. Therefore, we are going to create a new server and this time we are going to back or not back up, but we are going to restore a backup to it and um, 
It won't be the backup that we just did because it was empty, but another one with a little bit of data in it. Okay, here we are in Linode. I'm going to grab myself a fresh server. And we are into the new server. So let's put Postgres in. It's the same commands that we used before. Daemon tools. Mol G. And uh, the configuration that we are going to use is pretty much the same. It's just that we change this to be existing instead of new but otherwise it stays the same. I use the same key for all the demo backups that I'm doing. So let's paste that in. And this configuration, I'm going to put it in. We don't want to overwrite the current backup with some data from the current database because that database is not in line with the data right now, but it doesn't matter because this is not picked up by the server until we restart or reload the configuration. So it's not the problem. But what we are going to do now is stop the server instead of restarting it. So it will never pick it up. And we are going to restore the data. The way that restore works is that you first grab a base backup and then you um, Postgres will use the wall archiving or the data that we have archived to restore up until the latest state that it can get. And it works using this uh, restore command. So I'm going to put this configuration into Postgres and it's the restore command configuration. The way we will call it is by using nvd, we're going to load the environment variables like we did before and then call wall g and wall fetch. And then every time Postgres needs to fetch more wall data, it's going to send this command over to wall G, which will load it from our storage. And as you, yeah, I just send that configuration into the end of the Postgres SQL config file. Let's do that. Great. And now we will switch over to the Postgres user and we will remove the data directory or the Postgres directory so that we can use wall G to restore it with the latest from our backup. And I can even do this just to show you which backups we have. There's another command. I'm going to copy this in. It's called list, so backup list instead. And you can see I have one base backup here. So that will be the latest. And uh, if we continue here, we'll see that I'm touching a file that doesn't exist right now. And it's the recovery.signal file. It's a signaling file that tells Postgres that it will should boot up in recovery mode. So Postgres starts up and it will see, oh, we have this file. So we better go and restore ourselves and do its thing. So let's do this. Okay, backup was restored and we touched the file. Good, now we can start Postgres, but I can't do it as the Postgres user because the Postgres user does not have the rights to do it. Let's do it as root. Just to make sure that everything is working, we are going to load psql using the Postgres user. And we are going to go and get the test state that I had in this backup. It's, uh, let's first connect to the test database and we are going to select everything from test data. And you can see I have a bunch of timestamps here. Backup is done. Full restore is done. Next up is point in time recovery. We are not going to create a new server for this. We are going to use the one we are using. Uh, as you remember, we had six timestamps in the test data table and those timestamps represent times when they were inserted. 
And what we are going to do now is use point in time recovery to restore the database into a state in between two of these timestamps. So these two are the timestamps that we want to get in between. So let's quit this and stop Postgres. We already have the restore command. What we are going to add now is this recovery target time and recovery action. The recovery target time is the time that we want to restore to. And the, the recovery target action is what we want the server to do after we have reached the point. And in this case, we are doing promote, which means that it will end the recovery mode and we it will start accepting connections and just work. So let's shoot these two into the configuration file. What I also want to do now is go into the configuration file and I am going to turn off the archiving so we don't accidentally start archiving stuff in this weird state. Off is the default value for this. I'm just going to save that. And now switch user and we will copy these commands to do the cleanup of the folder. Now the file is restored and we have the recovery signal file again. It's, uh, that's it. It's time for us to start the server. Oh, yes, we can't do that as this user. So exit and do it from this user instead. And now if everything went well, we will be able to see only the expected rows. Yes. We don't have anything after the point in time we restored to, which was this time. If you wanted to re continue from this state, I suggest that you change your S3 location for your backup after this and start the archiving and then you do a new base backup. You just keep all your old backups until you feel that you don't need them anymore and just start restoring or recording backups to this new location. Now you know how to set it up and how to get the data back. But there is one more thing that you have to take care of and it is the data that you have backed up. And also ensure that you're doing base backups and delta backups. And we are going to configure the cron tab to handle this for us. Configuring the cron tab is not very much work. We can just do it quickly here, uh, continue and or exit, quit, copy this. This will uh, switch to user Postgres and open the cron tab in edit mode for that user. And uh, we will use win. And I'm going to go to the last line and I'm going to insert a new line here. So let's copy this. And this command, it will run and there and load the environment like we have done many times before in this video and then call wall G. It will call the delete command and will tell it to retain and use find full to find the 30 most recent backups and keep those. And find full means that if the 30th backup is a delta backup, it will go backwards to find a last full one. You can't just have a delta backup and restore from that if you don't have a previous full base backup and all the deltas before it. And confirm is very important because otherwise it won't do anything. It will just be a dry run. And uh, we will also run a base backup either full or delta depending on which it is in the numbers and we run it one hour after the cleanup happens which means that we will store more data that's how i want to do it you can change that let's look at the command it's end there and wall g like we've done before and then it's backup push and the directory of the postgres data just these two commands and if you want to fiddle with them, I suggest fiddling with the 30. It's the number of backups and the time when you want to have it done. 
And now we just escape here and write and quit. And we are done. Before I leave you, I want to give you some important information. Major versions matter. If you made a backup from Postgres 13, that means that you can only restore to a cluster with Postgres 13. So you cannot use this backup procedure to upgrade your database. Point in time restores can't go backwards in time. That might sound weird, but if you think about it, you first restore base backup, then you play forward the write ahead log until you get to the target time that you're targeting. But you can't do that if your base backup was taken after the point in time that you want to restore to. So what you have to do is go back to an older base backup to be able to go to that time. Test your backup. One way of testing it is to just take a piece of data that you know when it was changed, create a new server, you restore your data up until the time before it was changed. Pretty much just like we did in this video. And then if it works out and the data looks good, it's all good. If it isn't, then you will have to fix your setup. It's very important that you fix this right now if you discover it. While you fix this, you set a new path in your S3 storage so you don't overwrite the old backups that you have in case you really need to go back and maybe not all of it is broken, just the part that you wanted to go to. I hope you got what you came for in this video and thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. If you give this video a like, that would be awesome because it helps the channel. And this channel is about web development. If you're interested in that, you can subscribe. It's for intermediate developers, at least that's where I'm aiming for. That's it. I don't have any more content. I will just stand here now. Yeah, I'm just standing here doing nothing. Talking into the camera in the middle of the night. Family sleeping. I'm not. But I should be, I guess. You can click, there won't be anything more. This is it. The video is over. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.